Hey everybody, it's Friday and welcome to Moohead Radio. I'm your host, the Big and Furry Bovine. As you can see, you can call me Big Furry Moohead. You can call me Asshole. You can call me anything you like. That's why I've been doing this for 17 years and there's nobody else who's done it. Northeast Ohio Sports Talk for 17 years. Sometimes there's just not very much to talk about, but it does not dispirit a cow because a cow just grazes. A cow is a grinder by nature. So uh, we'll be here. You know, you may not be, but you'll catch it on replay. And if not, you'll catch it from a hooker in a back alley. So it doesn't make any real, real difference. Uh, I want to start out the program. Uh, you know, should I start it out on a positive or a negative? I think I should start it out on a positive because people look at me as being a rather critical cow. You know, uh, it's really hard to watch professional sports sometimes because you get the feeling that the league is uh, uh, vested in such a way that uh, outcomes are quite predictable. And we're halfway to the finals we want to see. The Phoenix Suns are in and the Clippers are out. L.A. is gone and New York is gone. So, you know, we have that going for us. Uh, They've really milked it to a game seven. And uh, whether Trey Young, I have to imagine Trey Young has to play. I have to imagine Giannis has to play. Uh, You know, I I thought it was really kind of a shame uh, that uh, Atlanta couldn't have done better against a a Giannis-less Bucks team. But, you know, you're going to wait till that final game and good luck to you. Uh, It's going to, you know, it's going to take uh, everything that the Hawks have to get it done as it seems that the Bucks kind of pushed the Hawks around. They didn't have Trey Young to get set up in the offense going up and down the floor. Instead, they got the sweet Lou Williams who can throw him up from outside, but the pace of the game was lacking and uh, that beating the team up the floor thing you know, the Bucks were able to pound, pound, pound. The thing that's exciting to me is not just that the Phoenix Suns are in. I always like to see a new team, fresh team, young faces, new talent represented. There's a much bigger story. How would you feel if at the end of every season you're recognized as a really, really good basketball player? But you're waiting for your off-season vacation to begin. And it's not because of Carmelo Anthony. It's because LeBron James is going to the finals. And if you're CP3, you know, they all, every off-season, they and their families, they go on a trip together. But LeBron always makes them wait because he's always in the finals. This year... LeBron's going to have to sit and wait for CP3. And I think that may be the best part of the whole NBA playoffs. Chris Paul has played so many years in the NBA. I mean, and with uh, recently, uh, you know, with a number of teams and uh, his better days behind him. So they said. You look at his career that started in 05, 06. He is, uh, what, a year younger than LeBron James. But Mm -hmm. he came in the league at 20 years of age. He's 35 now. In the most important last gasp, get into the finals kind of thing. At 35, he scores 41 points and leads his team to victory. It couldn't have been written better in a script. You never hear bad things about Chris Paul. You never hear about how selfish a guy he is. And believe me, he's played for a number of teams. I mean... Yeah. He, he, he's he's been around 
and consistently a great ball sharer point guard who has become a 50% floor shooter, although even early in his career, his two-point shot was always effective from two-point range. His three-point percentage has always been somewhere around 37 38%. He's not what we'd call a prolific three-point shooter, but he can make them. But recently, with the Suns and the Thunder and the Rockets and the Clippers... To come back and nail the Clippers is almost as fun as exhuming the, the 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 lost body of the former owner of the of the Clippers, uh, so you can bitch slap him around the room. Um, then you have New Orleans. You know, it, it's like this guy. If anyone deserves to make it into the finals, it's him. And it's going to be hard not to root for the Suns in the playoffs. I mean, in the finals, it's going to be really hard. I mean, and I know if the league now has its choice, they they want Giannis and the Bucks in there just because. Yeah, the bigger star power. That's right. They want ratings. I'll say this. Giannis with a bum leg and Brooke Lopez ain't going to make it up and down the floor in time to catch up with the Suns. I don't think they'd have a chance with those slow, hulking giants. I really don't. Now, the Hawks, on the other hand, are exceedingly well coached. Nate McMillan has done an outstanding job. Trey Young has been amazing, but he's not the most powerful guy in the world. He may be tiring. His body may be breaking down. But they at least could play up and down some and up-tempo the game. But I looked last night, and man, you want to talk about Bogdanovich was just, man, he was sucking the joint out, man. They played a lousy game. They just couldn't make anything from behind the arc, and the and the Hawks live behind the arc. So that's that's that. But I just you know want to start off the show with something positive. Something good does sometimes happen, even in the ridiculously overpublicized world of the NBA superstars. But and and you can cheer this on. I'm going to be cheering Chris Paul on because what. What a great way to close out a career. And I'm not saying this is his last year. I'm just saying, God damn, he's waited 15, 16 years for this shit. You know, that's a long time. So good for him. The other thing that I want to talk about, not so positive. I think anybody who has watched this show for a long period of time knows that I have strong opinions about players who come through Cleveland sports. The guys who I praise, like LeBron James, who did the unthinkable by bringing a championship back to Cleveland, to the absolutely sublimely bad, like Johnny Manziel, or the worst ownership that you can imagine, Randy Lerner. Although the Dol- Dolans are definitely giving them a, giving him a run for his money. Well, you know the my feeling is that when I'm watching teams play, it isn't like just team allegiance. I got to kind of get to know the players a little bit, their style and all that. Like right now. You know, if you would have gone back to 2016 uh, and and said, oh, you know, here we go. Look at Kevin Love moving his feet and and, and, and guarding Steph Curry and and stopping him on a critical, critical three in the end of the game. And I say, hey, he really put forth effort, even though he's not the most athletic guy in the world. You ask me about him today, and I'm just shaking my head and saying, you know, leave already. I just leave. I mean – 
to be complaining now when you had it so good in Cleveland that you're not winning or whatever the problem is, that you just give the ball to the other team and that kind of horseshit, go back to Minnesota and keep losing, you know? And you can tell everybody about your mental illness there, all right? Because professionally speaking, it's not good for him. And now, of course, everybody's picking up on the story that the Cavaliers are looking to trade him. You can't trade him. The point is his contract is not not tradable and you're and if you do you're gonna have to pay so much of it you're gonna put yourself in a hole anyway so it makes it all the more worse when a guy like kevin love starts acting up like that so guys in cleveland who come and go i was never i i have nothing against jim tomey all right nothing against jim tomey whatsoever except i'm convinced to use steroids all right And that's just based upon visual evidence. I never seen anybody get so big in my life compared to the time he came up into the big leagues, except for Bonds. Well, even, uh, uh, oh shit. Mark McGuire. Yeah. Mark McGuire. He was about 230 pounds when he came up, and then he ballooned up to almost 300 pounds. I mean, it was it was like watching a cartoon, or you know what it was like. It was like watching the WWE. It was like if you knew the Ultimate Warrior before he was the Ultimate Warrior, and then when steroids came into the picture, and you looked at the change in his body, you went no fucking way. You know, you started seeing guys like. Andrew Galata, I don't know if you remember him, the Polish, the foul pole, they called him because he hit people in the dick all the time, boxer <laughs> from Poland. This this guy, he had acne all over his fucking back. I mean, it, it was pure steroids, man. You could just tell by looking at it. So, you know, it's not that I have anything against Jim Tomey, nice guy, uh, praised, I think maybe overpraised by fans. Uh, because he did leave to go other places and, uh, you know, yeah, he can hit the ball a country mile. There ain't no doubt about that. But you saw when he first came up, he, I mean, when the minor leagues, he was 300 hitter in the beginning of his career, 300 hitter, his batting average took a dip down so he could hit like 45 home runs in a year. And you know what the price was. And he and McGuire, and again, it's circumstantial evidence, fishing buddies in the offseason makes you wonder what they're fishing for. So, you know, but one guy that I can tell you that I never liked, and that's Trevor Bauer, and never questioned his ability as a pitcher. In fact, I was intrigued by all that weird long throwing he was doing in the outfield and some of the mechanical things. And I didn't even hate him when he was talking about, you know, the spin rates that everybody was pimping and how Houston had used it to their advantage. And now it comes out that all this sticky substances have been used by major league pitchers uh, on baseballs. The batting average of the major leagues has gone up seven points since the league cracked down on it about a week and a half ago, that kind of thing. You know, it, it, I I didn't have a problem if he wanted to narc out pitchers for doing certain things. The thing I couldn't stand about him is that he's lost somewhere upstairs. There's something missing, like him and his drone and ripping his hand up at an important time of the year or his bizarre opinions about things that, you know, rival Kyrie Irving's. But I, and looking at him, he just not my kind of guy. And, you know, he would, and, and then when he got traded, uh, it, well, you know, he's free agent and, and got paid the big bucks. Then he starts acting up on the mound by inciting fans, by gesturing to them and doing all that stuff. Now uh, we have a story that has absolutely no white hat in the story. You never watch a movie where there isn't a good guy. It's really hard to do. Can you imagine if you had Clubber Lang versus Rocky Balboa in Rocky Three, but both of them were hateful people? 
the music would swell and you'd say, why is the music swelling? I don't like either of these people. Somebody has to wear the black hat. Somebody has to wear the white hat. That's what makes the story go. And this well, story- the, deal, the only one that I can think of offhand is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, I mean, there are movies, I would say, Unforgiven, the Clint Eastwood Western. I mean, there's nobody in that movie you can look upon who isn't damaged and uh, an outright murderer, including the young guy in the movie who becomes one because he looks up to these people. But, man, when you read this story about Trevor Bauer and this woman... And that Trevor Bauer is obviously into violent sex and he found himself someone or somebody found him, you know, the big payday going to Los Angeles, you know, somebody's going to find you. And this is the thing I don't understand about Bauer. For somebody who espouses all of these opinions about all kinds of things, he's not a very smart person. I mean, the first thing you got to know when you sign that kind of a free agent contract is there are going to be people coming out of the woodwork to get a piece of you. And if you're going to be on there texting with a woman and you're going to bring her over and you want to have violent sex and you use your hair to choke her until she's unconscious, you're a sick motherfucker, but not nearly as sick as the next time around when you punch her eyes black and blue and punch her in the vagina. Okay. Now, you'd be saying, Mr. Moohead, why aren't you expressing any sorrow? Hi, Big Lurker UK. How you doing? Why are you expressing no sorrow for the woman in this story? And the reason is, I'm up to here with the woman thing. Okay? Women are people. Men are people. There is no superior sex or gender. And I do believe there are two genders, and I don't think we have to introduce new pronouns to describe them. Sis, boom, ba, bye. I don't care about that shit. What I care about is that there are people in the world who are sick, who need help. This woman responds to him, and it's one of two things. She sees an easy way into his money by getting him to do this act. And then she goes ahead and she steps forward and says, this is what he did to me. But she ain't smart either because she's texted it and said to him, I want to, you know, be together with you and you can do whatever you want. Choke me out. Choke me out if you want to. And he did. He did what she wanted. Sick fuckers, both of them. And and so then she goes in her complaint. So the next time I went back and I'm like, the next time? My God, it's like, you know, I don't understand it. I brought a friend over and Charles Manson had his family killed. So the next time I went over there and brought another friend, he ended up getting his family killed too. Just wrong. What second time? But the second time, I guess, is terrible, man. He beat her senseless. And then, just when you start thinking to yourself, well, this was all a setup, Bauer opens up his big mouth and says to her via text, I would never have done that to you if it wasn't sexual. Now, they, Major League Baseball has put him on administrative leave for seven days. All right, that is not a suspension. He's still getting paid. He just can't do anything right now. They want to collect more facts. The woman... One way or another, the story's going to come out on her, too. And I would not be surprised if she's just psycho. I mean, anybody who would allow themselves to be used as a punching bag that way has problems. And there are self-mutilators in the world. There are people who have these kinds of psychological problems. 
So we ask ourselves, who's the innocent, who's the guilty, who is the victim, and who is the perpetrator? I think we're the victim for having to hear all of that shit. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I'm being serious because we, we talk so about I, because it's like, you know, oh, these people. No, no, I, I, I mean, and people have free choice and say, hey, go ahead and beat me to a pulp, uh, you know. But if that person has a background of psychological problems that is was being treated and is off their meds or whatever. I mean, and somebody says that and you see they're, they got a screw loose and you go ahead and punch them in the vagina, you got, you know, then you got some real anger management issues and to relate the act of sex to punching someone out. Here's the upside. It wasn't out. a double anal fisting. <laughs> Well, no, the first time he choked her out and butt-fucked her. There's yeah. the magic word. Where's the bird? It's supposed to be, oh, you bet your life. Seriously. When she woke up from her asphyxiation, she was being anally penetrated. <laughs> Jim Lang with the dating game. <laughs> Today's bachelor likes to choke out his partners and butt-fuck them. Trevor Bauer, ladies and gentlemen, you, you know. I don't want to see him pitch anymore. He needs help. He he's not it's not safe to have him out in society. I'm sorry. And her, same thing. Same thing. I, 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 she should be immediately taken in for some kind of like a psychiatric unit. They're like the two characters in uh, Life in the Fa the song Life in the Fast Lane. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and you know something, Rick. We talked about this before when Rick used to come on the show all those years ago. We said, you know, Trevor's gonna find a way to fuck this up. Things were going just a bit too swimmingly in Cleveland. Now, weren't they? And his sickness was subdued. It was the same concept that we had with J.R. Smith. Remember the first year J.R. Smith was in Cleveland? And it was like, J.R. couldn't be J.R. Because it's like, God damn. He said, I can't get into any trouble here because there's nothing happening after 11 o'clock at night. That's what it's like in, in Northeast Ohio. I mean... Second, he got into the bright lights in Los Angeles. All this shit goes down, and you're seeing the real Trevor Bauer. And having a great year, don't matter. Can pitch, don't matter. You know, I don't want to see him again, and I don't think baseball should even, I mean, they should send him off for help, and he should get down on his hands and knees, something that he will never do. The thing about Trevor Bauer is he never gives an inch. That's that's his style. That's really all I have to say, except the next story is going to make you even happier to know that Josh Gordon is filing for an NFL reinstatement. I mean, we're just counting, you know, you need a fucking abacus to figure out this is the sixth time now. I don't care about Josh Gordon. And you don't invigorate your football career by playing with Johnny Manziel in the fan league. Make it stop. But talking about players that have made their way through Cleveland, now Trevor Bauer and, of course, Josh Gordon, part of the amazing history of Cleveland sports. If you have a Cleveland a player who played for a Cleveland sports team that you fucking hate, write him in the chat room. The, the person who's like, thank God they're gone and I don't have to see it anymore. Like Jake Bowers would be one for me. I don't want to see that anymore. And he didn't do anything to anybody except to the fans. He took their money and uppercutted his way into non-existence. How is Jake Bowers doing with his new team, I wonder? I'm going to look that up as we speak. Didn't he have a new no-hitter for the Yankees? 
Is that the one that went to the Yankees? No, Jake Bowers is a first baseman and uh, oh. outfielder. Uh, we'll go to baseball reference, the home of such things. Um, so far, divided between two teams. Well, he's actually doing better in Seattle. Isn't that nice? Because in Cleveland, well, in Tampa Bay, he hit a 201. And Cleveland, a 226, and then a 190. But he's since he got, it's only 18 games, though. Shouldn't get too excited in Seattle. 279. But he's only hit one home run in 68 at-bats. Yeah, but if there are any that you can't stand, write them in the chat room. I, I, I love this part of sports. And most of them aren't even in base, uh, aren't even in the, the different leagues now. Yeah. But, right, you know, I'm just waiting for Ben Roethlisberger to get the fuck out of the NFL. I think most people are, and I think the Steelers... What's the point? Oh, the other one that I would like to see gone is Tom Brady. I want to see a defensive player hit that son of a bitch so hard. He literally flies in two flies away in two pieces. You know, like the wildwood weed, all good things must come to an end. I have nothing against Tom Brady. I don't like the owner of the Patriots. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting. He won the uh, Super Bowl for the, uh, the Buccaneers. That's great. Uh, uh, he, he's a, a superbly talented and gifted quarterback. He doesn't bother me that much. He's a little bit hung up on himself and a little bit, you know, high-toned uh, would be a nice way of putting it. But, no, it isn't like these guys who are attention grabbers, you know. Rox and I have been having arguments. I don't even know uh, what the, the the sprinter's name, the Olympic uh, sprinter who's stated that she will refuse to honor the national anthem if she meddles. You know, and we're right back to that again. And now that's being blown up all out of proportion and all this because, you know, this evil. Well, I thought you were going to go with the other one that uh, apparently is. Marijuana. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The sprinter. Yeah, well, I mean, she has coping mechanism I problems. Have, uh, I'd ha uh, well, no, she's using it for recovery. No, she claimed that it was because a relative died, and, oh. and she and so she fell back on that and, and medicated herself. And that, but look, that's what happens to Josh Gordon too. He says he wants to play football, but once the pressure of having to play the actual game uh, rears his ugly head, he's back with the weed, you know, and dancing with Mary Jane. That's that's the thing. I mean, people who can't cope—that's their coping mechanism. But here's the story that made me. And laugh. yes, Amsterdam, we are talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> I rarely talk to him because I don't know what language he speaks. I really don't. <laughs> well, he, that's because you're not stoned enough. That's exactly right. <laughs> take some quail. Take about five quaaludes, and then you'll be uh, all on the same wavelength. What is it like being? Mary Kay Cabbage Head's bitch. And I wonder, you know, has anybody heard from Bronk at all? Nope. Not since the last time he was on, and that was... A little while ago. May? Yeah. <laughs> first, yeah. first part of May? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, I bring him up because Mary Kay Cabbage Head. And... Imagine being her bitch, lower on the totem pole than. Here is, uh, I, I can't believe this. Drafting the Browns offense into two teams. This is what they're basically doing. And what they're asking money for on Cleveland.com. I get a real kick out of this. Here are the rules. A quarterback, five offensive linemen, and then however you wanted to put a legitimate 11-man offense on the field, the 12th bonus player provides flexibility and offers a chance to stick it to the other drafter. But the bonus player could only be taken starting in the fifth round, and it couldn't be a quarterback. So what they do is there's Team Mary Kay and Team 
Doug Lesbier. Is that is how Lesbier? Lesbier. Is that how you pronounce the name? Yeah. Why is T. Mary Kay, Mayfield, Chubb, Beckham, Peoples Jones, Higgins, Hooper, Wills, Michael Dunn, Harris, Wyatt Teller, Chris Hubbard, and Anthony Schwartz? And Team Dog, the quarterback, is Case Keenum. <laughs> I, I can't even go on. He's got David Njoku. He's well, got because Harrison they can. Bryant. Uh, I think the deal was they could only pick it if they're both drafting head to head. If Mary Kay drafts Baker Mayfield, then the other one can only pick one of the other quarterbacks on the team. That's what I'm saying. So if you're Doug so. Lamarie's, then you're like. Well, I guess this is over. You just took Baker and I got Keenum. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What kind of, yeah, that would really make me think very little of myself and my employer's opinion of me. So I stopped reading the article after that because there was really no point to it. Oh, I do want to mention the Cleveland Indians because I told you that they were going to fall off a cliff any minute. And now they're halfway down the cliff. They're wild. They're wily coyote with that oh fuck look on their face. One more. They're holding the little sign that says "help." Yeah. <laughs> right before they go plunging to the earth. Every day it's but a I new said player. They'd only win. Uh, you know, I thought they'd only win like twenty-five or thirty games at the most. Pitchers hit. You know, Ramirez. He bounces back, and he fouls the ball off his own face. No, I'm serious. I, I, I mean, God is fucking with the Dolans, okay? And now it's like, you don't oh. want to pay anybody? Well, then I'm going to make you one of the laughing stocks of the fucking major league. And, when, and when next we, year we'll see whatever triple A team they decide to feel or double A in place of the Indians. When we finally started getting something out of the guy we got from the twins who was Tony's who used to kill the Indians. And I'm now I'm, I, I I'm blanking on his name. Cause he's now says he's got, um, abdominal, Alzheimer's. no uh, abdominal strain. And so every person who could possibly, uh, Eddie Rosario, uh, <laughs> he's gone. And for how long, who knows? But this this isn't even a team anymore. I mean, starting, you know, and of course they're going to lose every single game to the Astros. Of course they are. They had to pick J.C. Mejia. And that's what the fans say. Jesus Christ, Mejia again. He entered the fifth inning with the lead. However, on a little routine fly ball to right field, Harold Ramirez didn't react. By the time he did, the ball fell 20 feet in front of him, and that was the beginning of the meltdown for Mejia. Maybe they should keep some tequila in the dugout. Well, I mean, the thing is, Harold Ramirez can hit. He can't field. He's Charlie Spikes in his rookie year. He just can't, can't, I mean, he's putting up decent numbers and he hits ball, but he goes the opposite way. He's a good hitter, but man, he is uncoordinated in the field, doesn't get good jumps. They've tried him in left, center, and right field, and he just can't get it done. I mean, by the time everything was over, the game was over. That inning was, that's it. Done. The Indians have absolutely no margin of error, and now their bullpen is falling apart because they're being taxed. Every game now is a like bullpen by committee game. And if I have to see Phil Maton one more time or Cal Quantrill one more time, these are not major league players. But we're stuck because they're all injured. Our pitchers are injured. 
I, our but I said that was going to happen. It, it all look when you you want the sixty million dollar payroll, and you have no depth. Of course, it's going to happen, and you have no minor league affiliates with any potential star players. This is beginning to look like the Vernon Stouffer Indians of the 60s, one the ones that traded Rocky Calavito for Harvey Keen all those years ago. They got nothing, and they got nothing in reserve. They got Who are their best prospects? The guy who started out the season, Andre uh, Jimenez, the shortstop who couldn't field and couldn't hit, they sent him down, and now he's you know hovering around 260 batting average in the minor leagues, and that's exactly where he belongs. That's what we got for, you know, you know, the Mets gave us compensation. Isn't that great? We don't have major league players. We have no depth. Of course, that's what's going to happen. Usually people get injured. What winds up happening, ah, you know, somebody can do a suitable job. We're beyond suitable job now. We got a catcher. I don't even know where he came from, Lavarani or whatever his name is. I don't even know where the fuck he came from. Austin Hedges is bad enough. And I'll tell you, Cesar Hernandez He's not having a good year hitting the ball. He's become more of a power hitter, which is just what we need. Another guy with a 216 batting average. But that man cannot bend over to pick up a ground ball. Something wrong with him. I'm telling you, there's something wrong. Because I did not see these problems last year. Anything that is anywhere to the to the left of him, to the right of him, he tries to bend down. He doesn't even his glove doesn't even get to the ground. And he has a 216 batting average. And it's like, ah, oh, he's having an off year. No, we're going to find out that he's got a major problem, too. That's what we're going to find out. And now the bullpen is starting to fall apart because they're being overused. Not only are they being overused, they come in with this hopeless feeling. There's, they're not coming into games where we're ahead, <laughs> they're, they're eating innings where we're behind. Yeah. And so the, the entire spirit of the team is drained. Yeah, it's just uh, too bad. But you wanted me to notify you when the wheels were coming off and, and give Terry Francona all the credit in the world for keeping this thing glued together as long as he has. Francona's health is fragile. I think he should leave the game. Get himself or at least healthy. leave the fucking Indians. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> go go coach in, in Seattle or some fucking thing. Get yourself healthy and then take a job with a professional team that's run by professional people who are trying to win. It, it, it's sad. Uh, Urban Meyer find $100,000 you know, he's going to learn. What, Never for fun. tampering? Well, yeah, they, listen, uh, according to Adam Schefter, the Jaguars were fined two hundred grand, and and separately, uh, Urban Meyer was fined 100000 for unspecified OTA rules violations. They're the heftiest fines levied against the three NFL teams facing discipline. The 49ers and Cowboys were fined 100000 and their coaches, Kyle Shanahan and Mike McCarthy, each $50,000. We do not know the specific nature of the violations, but I will tell you this. Urban Meyer is used to an environment in which he can cheat all he wants to. I know this is not going to make me popular in Northeast Ohio. But being the University of Alabama of the North being the team that gets first crack at all of the good athletes. They're doing something in Columbus and it ain't kosher, but these guys get away with it. Not going to get away with it in the NFL. And you're not at the Ohio State anymore. You're the lowly 
Jacksonville Jaguars with their owner. Wait a minute. Con! It's over. It's over before it begins. He wanted to take his shot. You know, all we hear about Urban Meyer is, oh, he gets terrible headaches and this and that. It's just beginning, man. It's just beginning. And by the way, how's that Tim Tebow thing paying off? I want to see the Jacksonville Jaguars lose because of him. Oh, I can't do this anymore. My head. Oh, oh God. It's just wearing down on me. I need more family time. What? There's an NFL job opening? But he'll soon find out what Indians fans know. <laughs> That's not a professional <laughs> football team opening. It's a one in 15 team. And you can't cheat your way out of it either. So, tonight we have the big game. Is tonight the big game seven with the Hawks and the Bucks? Is it tonight, I believe? Uh, no, I think it's tomorrow night because they tomorrow. just played last night. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like to be back to back just to see. I mean, make it a fucking war. They of used attrition. to do that. Yeah. War they of used to do that because it, it was a different format then. It was a 2 3 2. So you you had uh, game three and game four were back to backs. Yeah, this is uh... <laughs> good old days. Hmm. No, it's nice to hear, you know, uh, a, a Browns, you know, guy like Greg Newsom saying, you know, it's all about believing in yourself, you know. There's a guy who's got some swag to him and some confidence. I want to see this guy hit the field running, man. You know, instead of this, oh, you know, I'm just a new guy and I just uh, got so much to learn. You know, it's like nose to the grindstone, <clears throat> absorb everything. But, man, a cornerback can't be shit without confidence, really. you got to have big dick confidence well and it was a real boon this year with the uh, rookie minicamp because there were more coaches than players so yeah. they each got in a lot more individual attention than they would normally get because you'd have you know like 50 guys or whatever 75 guys with the with the coaching working with the coaching staff so you you would be more like in a training camp style approach where you can't get the individual attention and and make corrections right then and there no do it this way so and then it's funny i'm watching uh the, the clippers go down and watching ty Lu uh, go down with the ship and no Kawhi leonard on the floor because he's hurt you know and that was that was the end of them but honestly, Stan Van Gundy. That's who they wanted as their coach, man, New Orleans. And I told everybody who would listen, all the Pelicans are is the initial place that Zion Williamson will play. And after his five years are up, He'll build his stats up playing for a shithole team and he'll get a massive offer to go West. Okay. I mean, this is as predictable as predictable could be. But the thing that's amazing is nobody ever accused Stan Van Gundy of being the smartest coach of the NBA. It's kind of like watching Budenholzer on the verge of tears, seemingly. I swear to God, if Budenholzer loses game seven to his old team, <laughs> you're going to see crocodile tears that will not quit. But Stan Van Gundy does not think that Zion Williamson had anything to do 
with his exit from the organization. And he doesn't think that Zion Williamson or Brandon Ingram or any other player had anything to do with his departure. You know what the problem is? He's too used to getting fired. Well, I mean, you take a job, you get some money, John beeline it into town, then <laughs> beeline your way out of the town. J.B. Bickerstaff. I mean, you can't tell me that J.B. Bickerstaff doesn't have his own moving van. You can't tell me that. <laughs> Another one with Mayflower on speed dial. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the Pelicans aren't good. And the organization is not good. And you give somebody a promising young player and you give them Brandon Ingram and that's what you give him and whatever there is else around him throwing a member of the Ball family. And that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you get. That's the deal. Well, you saw what they were. Not good enough. Not good enough to go anywhere. And that's what it will continue to be. There are players, guys like Pistol Pete Maravich, who were really wonderful, wonderful basketball players, but they were doomed to be the big name draw on a lousy team. You see it all the time. Kevin Love was a good example in Minnesota. It's like, you know, hey, he's your perennial all-star. And Garnett before that? Yeah, perennial all-star, team can't get off the ground. But it's even worse when it's like, I still think the fucking Pelicans are an expansion team. You know what I mean? It's like the Sacramento Kings. Hey, the Sacramento Kings got Chris Weber. It's like, <laughs> hey, they got Vladi Divac. No so, way. Then they moved him up into what position? And he's trying to be a general manager. It's like, you're not going to be able to do anything with that. Ask Kevin McHale. No, there's nothing you can do about it. There are players like Wilt Chamberlain who played in obscurity playing for the 76ers until he finally in 68 won it all. And then he ended up going to, for a brief period of time out West. But the majority of his time was right there in Philadelphia or with the old Warriors. And Wilt Chamberlain put up points and was the biggest draw in basketball, except his team didn't win. The question was, you think Wilt's going to score more than 50? His stats show that he averages that much a game, 50.4 points per game. That's because nobody else in the team knew how to play. By the time Wilt found his way to the Lakers, it was great. I thought that was just great. He actually, you saw that he would he could actually assist and pass the ball. Because he had players around him. Some guys, they just stuck in a bad town. But now you're stuck in a bad town for five years, six if they make, you know, if they want you back and can't trade you for anything of value. And it leads, if you're healthy, to a massive contract. That's what Zion's hoping for. Can't wait to leave New Orleans. Can't wait. And you know something, Tom? He didn't punch one of them in the vagina. Not one of them. Well, I guess that would depend on how tall they were. <laughs> it could have felt like a battering ram. <laughs> God almighty. Unlike Moose. <laughs> but at any rate... You know, I'm done with what I have to say today. I, I'm disappointed because 
I can't watch the Indians right now. And it's not, you know, the front runners kind of point of view that I don't watch triple a baseball or double a baseball. This Ernie Clement. I mean, he killed Josh Naylor. I mean, Naylor, that leg whip was right there with Joe Theismann as far as one of the grossest, you know, injuries. And it's because Ernie Clement, who doesn't belong in the major leagues, ran with his back to home plate, trying God only knows to make an over-the-shoulder catch, but wasn't looking ahead of him and saw that he was running directly into Naylor, who was going to go into the air to catch the ball, and Clement clipped him in the game. The season was over for Josh Naylor. And Clement can't hit the ball out of the infield. Why does this happen? I can't watch this shit. I really can't. It's horrible. The players are bad. And some of the guys pitching out there is leaving meatballs over the middle of the plate. Eli Morgan... You know, they celebrated his first win as an Indian. He gave up five runs in like five innings. And that's, oh, and that wonderful for Eli. He's Josh Tomlin without the control and the location. And you know how many home runs Josh Tomlin gave up. Eli Morgan is batting practice. Scary stuff. It's hard for me to get excited about that shit. But I'm hanging in there. And we will be back again on Monday to talk more of this shit with you. And, uh, if, 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 you, know, you know what you should do in the comments after the program here? If, if in the comments... Name some of your favorite failure Cleveland athletes. The ones that just make you say, like you felt about Johnny Manziel. Like he was like so happy to say goodbye. And the Browns have had a bunch of them. Had a bunch of players who were really bad through the years. Especially when they came back into the league. Fans made Tim Couch cry, right? That and a concussion. My God, there were so many players on the team that were so bad. You could count on them. They're going to drop the pass. They're going to fumble. You know, they were all a bunch of Sendejos. He's a recent vintage guy that I'm just so happy to see leave. And on every team, Jetty Osmond is my current one for the Cavaliers. I cannot wait until he leaves. Terrible. Kipnis would probably be one for me. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, there was a time when Kipnis could play. But, I mean, yeah, they kept bringing him back and bringing him back. And he just, what a slug he turned out to be. Gained weight. Wasn't, I mean, I don't know. That's another guy who's really, uh, and you know, I can't really, I can't really. uh, Yeah. He's on the Cubs. No, no, he's not. Well, he was, he's with the Atlanta Braves in the minor leagues. Oh, well. At least they were smart enough to put him where his talent is. In 2020, he played with Maybe the he's Cubs. a player coach, player coach in the fucking single A. <laughs> he's just horrible. I mean, I, I just don't, you know, he's like the new whatever happened to, you know. And now, we, now he's back in the minors again. And... Let's see what he's doing in the minor leagues if we actually have stats on him. His 2021 stats, 
He's hitting a 253 at AAA with three home runs and nine runs batted in. Boy, he's tearing it up. He's 34 years old and his listed weight is 200 pounds. Listed weight, 20 pounds heavier than that. Yeah, I was sick of him too. Absolutely sick of him. All righty. Oh, so somebody saw Sam McDowell pitch. Yeah, he, he definitely had a big arm. Big arm and a big appetite for beer. They said Rapid Robert, though, was faster. 98 miles an hour back in the 1940s. Can you beat that? Bob Feller. Oof. And if you ever saw the windup on Bob Feller, that ball was like coming somewhere out of the center field bleachers. <laughs> that was wild shit, man. Oh, there you go. Rick May is saying, for me, it was Max Elvis, the third, old third baseman. I'm not even reading this. I, I know who Max Elvis was, you know. Let's see what he's saying. He tried to catch a foul ball near third base, tripped over the bag and fell backwards. And the ball ends up fair, two feet from the base. Yep. It's amazing. How about our quest for shortstops? You know, it, it, it's amazing. Our infield, you know, remember Frank Duffy? Do you remember Jackie Heideman? Do you remember Tom Verizer? We had some of the worst fucking players you could imagine in the Cleveland Indians. Terrible. And it wasn't restricted to the 60s either. Do you remember when our biggest star was Toby fucking Hera? Honest to God. Those years were really hard to watch. I'm trying to think of the guy that played with Julio Franco. The guy who played, what, the shortstop? Yeah. While Franco was playing second base at, at the yeah. time? Yeah. Burke Jacoby was third. I can't remember who the fir first baseman was either. Uh, what year would that have been? Um, 86, 87. Wow. If I had, if I had the old status pro game, I, I, can pull it out, but I blank uh, everything. All anyone remembers is the Sports Illustrated cover and the death thereafter of the entire team. Corey Snyder, right? Corey Snyder was, uh, I think, right field. Joe Carter. Joe Carter, yeah. Paul Sorrento. Uh, I don't know uh, Amsterdam. He was in the nineties, I believe. Yeah, but, but he sucked by the time he came to the Indians. Yes, and so I can't really shit on Matt Williams that much either because they traded him, uh, traded for him late. Yeah, well, they from needed San a, Francisco. Well, that and was then, a, uh, an a, a loner, really, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, plus, he was going. Th that was right in the heart of his uh, nasty divorce. Yeah, I mean, Matt Williams though was a tremendous third baseman. I mean, you know, by the time the Indians were in contention, we got a lot of guys. Uh, you know, El Presidente, you know, who was a great pitcher in his day, but was a crafty one by the time we got our hands on him, you know, but they were good players. I'm talking about guys here like Jackie Heideman. What the fuck was that all about? I mean, it's like, make it stop. Richie Shinebloom, make it stop. The whole history of the Cleveland Indians is horrible. All right. I better get the hell out of here. But uh, Brian, Thanks. Thanks for joining no me again. And uh, wait, thank I'll you, Key, for stopping thank by. You, Key. Yeah, I was going to say that. Bye, Key. Yeah, that, that's you know that's but. And she made it through the entire show. How about that? How about that? Uh, everybody, hang in there. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the Fourth of July. Do not get fireworks near any of your digits, or else you will be one short. And uh, other than that, enjoy yourself. Have a fun time celebrating our Independence Day. We'll be back again come Monday on actual Celebration Day on the 5th, uh, which will be your day off. You have no reason not to join the program on Monday. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, hasta la vista, Pastor Heads. Good night. Bye.